a week ago, you paid your income tax. That tax is supposed to be your fair share of the burden of running this country and solving its problems. You have a right to expect that every other citizen and every corporation will pay a fair share too. But that didn't happen this year. It hasn't happened in a long time. In fact, our tax system all too often compels only the poor and middle Americans to ask what they can do for their country. Our tax system reflects a political system which gives the big breaks to the privileged and puts the heaviest burdens on you. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the government is us. We are the government, you and I, but not under Richard Nixon. Under Richard Nixon, the government is closed door deals for corporations like IT&T, while a young American home from Vietnam has to wait months for help from the Veterans Administration. Under Richard Nixon, the government is an $80 billion tax giveaway to big business and not one penny to create jobs for the 400,000 workers who are out of work here in Pennsylvania. Under Richard Nixon, the government is strict controls on wages and phony controls on prices so that you have to struggle not to get ahead but just to stay where you are. Richard Nixon has failed to come to grips with what is on your agenda. He's tackled the problems of Lockheed executives by giving them a $250 million loan. He hasn't even tried to tackle the problems of a machinist who can't find a $20,000 loan to buy a house in suburban Philadelphia. His staff has spent hours managing IT&T out of the difficulty of being too large and making too much money. There's no evidence that they have spent even 10 minutes on an effort to save the family farms of central Pennsylvania. So we are left with a government that responds quickly to the powerful, but shortchanges you. Most candidates in this primary are attacking government failure and government favoritism, but no politician invented this issue. It is your issue. At almost every turn in your daily life, you run head on into evidence of economic injustice. You write a check for your property taxes. And you know that they are too high. Your son talks about being a doctor or a lawyer, but you know that college is too expensive. You shop on a Friday night, and you know that groceries cost too much. It is one thing for a candidate to echo these frustrations, but no candidate can resolve our grievances simply by repeating them. The real work of 1972 is not to denounce government, but to put government back on the side of the American people. So the important question when you vote in the Pennsylvania primary is not what is a candidate against, but what is he for? And how would his election as president make a difference to you? I have proposed a freeze on food price increases. No other candidate has. And without action on food prices, no plan can end inflation. 
Indeed, the president's plan to end inflation isn't working any better than his secret plan to end the war. In February alone, retail pork prices went up at an annual rate of 80%, and beef prices climbed at a rate of 47%. If the present trend continues, a family that spends $30 a week for groceries now will have to spend $36 to buy the same amount a year from now. And if you spend $10 a week for meat in 1972, you will have to spend $16 in 1973. And yet the White House refuses to take any effective action to control the cost of food. A Republican senator recently described their policy this way. They did all they could to keep the steel prices from rising $2 a ton. But meat prices have gone up 10 cents a pound. That works out to $200 a ton. And at that rate, it is soon going to be cheaper to eat your automobile. Everybody talks about inflation. I think the president should do something about it. I think the other Democratic candidates should support my demand for an immediate 90-day freeze on rising food prices. And I think we need a system to prevent sky-high price increases in the future. I say, freeze food prices now. You can say the same thing by voting for me on Tuesday. I have also proposed a freeze on the enormous incomes of big businessmen. No other candidate has. And without action on this, controls on your wages simply are not fair. Phase two of Nixon's plan limits your annual wage increase to five and a half percent. Even the poorest workers, some of them earning as little as $1.91 an hour, are limited. But the limits on the big boys don't seem to work. The top two men at the Ford Motor Company got raises last year averaging $204,000. That's right, raises of $204,000 each. The president of Avco got a 79% raise, and the chairman of the board of Bendix saw his income climb by 130%, and the chairman of Eastern Airlines was paid 77% more. These are not isolated examples. The wallets of executives are being fattened in boardrooms across the country while you are fighting just to keep up with your rent or your mortgage payments. A laundry worker isn't allowed to have an increase larger than $5 a week under phase two. But the president of IT&T makes that much money every 45 seconds. Richard Nixon has all the power he needs to control the earnings of top executives. It is time for him to forget his debt to corporate America, which financed the last Republican campaign, and to remember that he is the president of a country, not the president of a corporation. It is time to freeze all forms of executive compensation at the current level for at least the next eight months. And I mean all forms, not just salaries, 
but everything from bonuses to company paid housing for business executives who now make more than $50,000 a year. You must find it hard to understand why individuals with earnings of several hundred thousand dollars a year deserve raises maybe ten times the total of all your paychecks for a year, while your standard of living is on the front lines in the battle against inflation. So do I. I say freeze the income of the top bracket. You can say the same thing by voting for me on Tuesday. I have also named the eight major corporations which paid no federal income taxes in one of the last two years. No other candidate has named those names. It's quite a list. Bethlehem Steel and Standard Oil of Ohio. U.S. Steel and Alcoa Aluminum, National Steel and Allied Chemical, West Vaco Paper and Republic Steel. They made a profit. They paid dividends to their stockholders, but they didn't pay one thin dime to the federal government. You paid your share of taxes and their share too. And what has President Nixon done about this? Absolutely nothing. He is on the side of the big businesses who hire million dollar lawyers to evade billions of dollars in taxes, just as he is on the side of the $200,000 executives, just as he is on the side of the chain stores who are reaping a profit from inflation. As president, I intend to close $14 billion worth of tax loopholes. Then I will bring in the best tax lawyers in the nation to find all the other gimmicks and shelters and unfair tax write-offs. And I will fight to repeal every one of them. No company should make money without paying taxes. None of you can do that now. And if I'm president, no corporation will ever do it again. I say it is time to ask the wealthy what they can do for their country. And you can say the same thing by voting for me on Tuesday. Together, you and I can change America. Together, we can achieve a purpose as old as the Democratic Party and as new as the IT&T scandal, to build a government that truly serves our people. This is not just a question of economics. It is a question of moral right. It is wrong for coal miners with black lungs to cough out their lives until there is nothing left because some public officials let private profit outweigh human needs. It is wrong for people to die before their time because they cannot afford medical care in a country that is first in the world in wealth but far from first in health. It is wrong for a father to have to sit at home and explain to his children why he cannot find a job in a trillion dollar economy. It is wrong for retired Americans to lose their homes because they cannot pay their property taxes and to lose their dignity because Social Security is so low that their lives are in fact insecure. Our goal is so easy to state. 
and so hard to reach. It is economic justice for every American. For a miner or factory worker, economic justice can be strict safety standards so that no man's livelihood jeopardizes his life. For those who are sick, we can offer national health insurance and take the dollar sign out of medical care. We can guarantee a job to every American who wants one. We can raise Social Security benefits by at least 20%. We can reduce and reform property taxes. These are different steps but they are all advances toward the goal of economic justice. And they all require that we tame corporate excess and end special favors. Those with a stake in the economic game that is rigged in their favor will oppose any attempt to make the system fair. Their power stretches from the offices of Wall Street to the White House itself. And yet, your power is greater. You are the people. In 1972, you can determine not only the identity of the nation's leadership, but the direction of the nation's future. You can vote against a president who speaks of the silent majority while he listens to a privileged minority. You can vote in the Pennsylvania primary for a commitment to economic justice, not as a slogan, but as a reality that can touch your own lives and neighborhoods. And how you vote tomorrow may decide whether you will have a chance to vote for what you want next November. If you want to freeze food prices, if you want to stop paying Standard Oil's taxes, if you want to change America, give me your help. This is the first round in the fight to move Richard Nixon out of the White House. This is the first round in our fight for economic justice. With your help, I can win this round. Then together, we can elect a president who will put government back on your side. Vote for Muskie, because you're not just voting in a primary, you're voting for a president. <laughs>